Gaza War, Day 308. No end in sight. Please don't be fooled by the latest U.S.-Egypt-Qatar ceasefire proposal. I'm sure longtime listeners are not fooled whatsoever by this proposal. To those of you who are new here, uh, just say, let's just say as a matter of logic that a ceasefire proposal that has neither of the belligerents is unlikely to succeed. This is not unlike when Biden came out months ago and used whatever was left of his mental faculties to make a ceasefire, say, to say that we have a ceasefire ready. And then Israel immediately said, no, we don't. And that was the end of that, pretty much. So this is another one of those. They're just throwing... Egypt and Qatar and, and the U.S. are just throwing out a thing saying, yeah, ceasefire. And Israel hasn't agreed. Israel is the one that is holding up a ceasefire. Israel is the one that doesn't want a ceasefire, but wants permanent occupation and genocide and extermination and rape, mass rape and torture and permanent imprisonment of um, the Palestinian that 10,000 plus Palestinians they're holding. So that's what Israel wants. And until Israel withdraws those troops, releases those prisoners and ends the siege, you will know that there's no ceasefire happening. So that, that uh, no end in sight remains. Today's Friday, so they had the Million Man March in Yemen. It was well attended despite the rain. Yesterday, uh, Abdel Malik Al Houthi made his Thursday speech, which he makes before the Million Man March. And he made a couple of points. I think for me, the main thing that he got across in his speech was that he was talking about how much the U.S. is moving into the region, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute or two. But he was talking about how much, how many preparations, how many missiles, how many, how many missile shields that the Americans had moved into the region, and he said, "We are in a stage of military development. We have to develop our technologies." We are developing answers to these, but, um, you know, uh, so that's that's the flavor of these days. Hezbollah is hitting, um, as, as always, Qassam brigades and the other factions in Gaza are still doing tight ambushes. The Yemen, Ansar Allah in Yemen are still um, hitting cruise destroyers, war, destroyer ships, and uh, ships heading into the Red Sea. So all of that is still happening, but this has, this these days since the assassination of Ismail Haniya until now, they have this feeling of waiting. It has this waiting period kind of feeling. And so... That's why this report tonight is is a lot to do with the preparations, the preparations for the war that both sides are making. Um, Al Houthi, what did he say? He else he said, yeah, he said the distances of their operations have expanded. The bankruptcy of Ailat or Um Al uh port. He mentioned the the significant control that the Ansar Allah has over the Red Sea and the Bab al Manda, but then they have, they're expanding their range. They're operating in the deep Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean, and deep into occupied Palestine. We need to develop our capabilities to overcome the capabilities of five entities, primarily the Americans and other Arab regimes and the Zionist entity. So our challenges contribute to further developing our capabilities. Um, he also says, he said something like, however, every, he said something like every shield will be penetrated nonetheless, something like that. So it was, it was a confident message, but it was not a, it was not an overly 
optimistic message. He said, you know, nothing, the response is inevitable. Nothing can avoid it. But then he said something like, um, he said something like, there won't be any, they, we will, we will defeat this, the shield. But, but like to, when I get more specific about what the Americans are moving in there, you'll see that it's the preparations that the Americans are making are dramatic. And so whatever the Axis is going to do, the Americans are trying to prepare a shield that is bigger and more resilient and stronger than what they shielded Iran, um, Israel with from the Iranian attack in April. So, I, you know, the American preparations are pretty good and they're ongoing. And so this is what I suspect is in part behind the delay of the Iranian response, which is that the Americans are putting everything in into play here. Um, there was also an assassination of a Al Qassam commander in Lebanon. So there are Qassam brigades operating in Lebanon and the Israelis assassinated one of those leaders, a field commander in Lebanon is a car. There's an invasion of Tulkarim, an Israeli invasion of Tulkarim in the West Bank. That's going on right now. And lots of operations in Rafah. Tel El Sultan, and I mentioned Hezbollah and Yemen, Iraq. There was a drone attack on a U.S. base just now, as I just before I recorded. But I wanted to make this report primarily about preparations. So there's on the Iranian side, there was a there was an announcement of new cruise missiles launched from or not launched uh new cruise missiles that they're yeah you don't want to say the word launched you want to say the word introduced um introduced to the world so the iranians are announcing have announced that they have these new cruise missile um and they're they're showing them off at this moment for the obvious reason that you might think so let me let me show you my let me show you these cruise missiles. So this is their cruise missiles. It says they have highly explosive, undetectable warheads and a long range. So these are not hypersonic. They're subsonic cruise missiles, but they're anti-ship missiles. There are up-to-date anti-surface and subsurface weapons, says the Navy, the Iranian Navy, 210 of the 2,640 different types of long and medium range missile systems, reconnaissance drones, and naval radars were said to have been added to the IRGC's arsenal. And they were presented on state TV on Friday. And the major general in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IG, the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, sorry, said, in today's world, you have to be powerful to survive or surrender. There's no middle ground. They made this presentation of the cruise missile. They did appear, they do appear to launch one. I'm, I'm watching a missile fly into the air. So it does appear to have actually included a launch of the missiles. Um, yeah, they're still fighting in Gaza City as well. Gaza City, Tel Al Hawa, um, TBC shells and explosives and a big ambush. So here's another shot of the new missiles. They have been showing on in the Iranian media. Here's another shot from the missile system. This one's been going around today in case you haven't seen it yet. So Iran is showing off its missiles. There was the meeting that we mentioned between the Russians, Shoigu came from Russia and they had extensive meetings between the, the highest levels of the military industrial complexes of both countries. And Russia's reportedly shipping cargo planes of 
things are going to Syria and they're going to Iran. And I've seen some pro-Russian channels are saying that this is partly Putin fulfilling his threat to go and supply America's enemies outside of Ukraine, Russia theater. He, he basically threatened that if the Americans continued to supply Ukraine with advanced systems, including F-16s and now, now F-16s after Atakums, after uh, what Abrams. So all of these systems that the Americans said they were going to supply and kind of floated and Russia said they shouldn't. And then they did anyway. And Putin th threatened them. President of Russia threatened them with um, supplying their enemies and now maybe, maybe that's what this is. Maybe that's what we're seeing now. So could be, um, here's a, so now resistance news network had this seven part series of, of telegram messages you may, you may probably know those of you who follow resistance news network on telegram. Um, this is where I get most of the material that I present in these sit reps is they, they're the ones doing the actual amazing work of putting it all out there in English for people like us. Um, if you ever tire of these videos or want to go straight to the source, uh, that's the source. RNN is, is the, is the source. And they did an analysis just earlier today, and it was called The Axis of Evil Prepares for the Inevitable, and it's seven parts. And I think that this is so useful in terms of analyzing what the U.S. is putting together in the region. So naval assets, they're going to bring the USS Abraham Lincoln. They have the USS Roosevelt, Roosevelt right now. There's a dozen F-18s, Hawkeye, re Hawkeye reconnaissance plane, and a squadron of F-22s to Qatar. F-22s being the supposedly the most advanced fighter jet in the world. And this is what uh, fully, fully populated, fully populated aircraft carrier looks like. And apparently the Iranians have said they they need two uh, of their new cruise missiles to sink an aircraft carrier and a smaller ship they can do with just one. Cyprus. Okay, Cyprus is you remember you may remember that in a in a speech, I don't know, about a month ago maybe. Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, the Lebanese resistance group that fights Israel. Nasrallah said, he warned Cyprus, he said, if you allow yourself to be used as a base for the enemy, then you will be treated as the enemy. And Cyprus has been warned and Cyprus is being used as a base for the enemy uh, from um the it's basically become like a backup Israel. So there are flights from Tel Aviv. Uh, there's a story in Al Akbar that the Resistance News Network is citing that a large American military delegation arrived in Cyprus, bringing with them a massive amount of equipment, weapons, and air defense systems never before seen in this quantity, turning Cyprus into an interception platform for the expected responses from Iran, Hezbollah, and Yemen. British bases strengthened their presence with air defense systems and experts, as did German forces in Cyprus. The German government has also approved the deployment of transport planes, naval vessels, and forces, supposedly to assist with the evacuation of Europeans from Lebanon and Israel in the event of a war. The Americans are also starting joint military exercises in Cyprus. In the end, uh, RNN writes, what is happening in Cyprus now is a militarization of the island seemingly against their will, but doesn't make it less partner 
less of a partner in the aggression. The British spy missions over Gaza taking off from Cyprus being another example. Basically, Cyprus is also the transshipment point for all the arms transfers from the U.S., as far as I know. So Jordan. Jordan is going to be intercepting missiles. It's going to serve as a base. There's a deal with the Americans that the, gives the Americans the unfettered access to Jordan if they want to use it to protect Israel, which they will. Jordan can do nothing, says RNN, but it repeat that it will not allow any party to use its airspace, pretending that the matter concerns its sovereignty in contrast to the reality that it is a partner against Gaza and Lebanon, Saudi Arabia as well, Morocco as well. So Saudi Arabia says they won't allow anyone to use their airspace, which is another uh, prelude to intercepting the resistance's weapons. It's still unclear whether they made an exception to that rule to allow Israel to bomb Hodeida, or maybe the Americans to bomb Hodeida. Did they really avoid Saudi airspace? If you look at a map, that would have been tricky to do. Maybe they did, I don't know. There's Cyprus is the evacuation deadline. Many settlers from Israel have even established residences and businesses on Cyprus since October 7th. So Cyprus again, Syria and Iraq and the U.S. bases there are also major uh, bases. They're going to come under attack by the Iraqi resistance. There has been a battle you may have seen in Syria, where tribal forces close to the Syrian government have attacked the SDF, which is US-backed and occupying a chunk, including the oil fields and gas fields of Syria, as well as their most of their breadbasket, has all been occupied by this, basically by the US, and the tribal forces uh, have, have been fighting them in recent days. So they've they've taken some oil fields, but I think there's been a counterattack, and so I'm not sure what the status of that is now. The bases, the the oil fields, the Konoko oil field, the Kharab Ajir base in eastern Syria, and the Al Omar oil field have all been reinforced with defensive systems, air defense. So they're building a, an air defense with sites in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, all over the Mediterranean, all over the, you know, the, the U.S. flotillas, the, the various flotillas, the aircraft carriers that are in the region, carrier battle groups, and then their Saudi and Iraqi bases. So the conclusion from the Resistance News Network is a storm approaches, resistance prepares to strike, and this is uh, their their kind of eloquent statement. They say, for every watchtower, there's a fighter waiting to tear it down. For every airstrip, there's a missile waiting to strike it. For every imperialist plan, there is an access ready, access, access ready to counter it. So there's some confidence coming from, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is RNN. This might be a, a translation. Um, it's not entirely clear to me who to attribute it to, uh, but it's certainly well-written and confident and a tough uh, statement uh, that, that, I, that I'm reading to you here. So now on the theme of preparation, before I call it a night on this short pre-World War III scenario sit rep, your day 38 sit rep. I want to also talk a little bit about an article called the a seven part article that is translated. And I think it's also from Akbar Al Akbar, Kings of the Sky, the story of the Air Force of Hezbollah. And it's about the gradual construction of their 
air force, the Hezbollah air force of drones and missiles and standoff weapons. This is what it looks like. It's a PDF that I downloaded again. I, I think I got it from the resistance news network and there's illustrations of the different weapons. And it talks about how, how, how long term the long term thinking the the strategic thinking the the starting from nothing the 1990s a group of people were training these things and some of them died during training um so the air force being in the air when the hezbollah air force especially in the early days was a pretty dangerous job the iran connection there's a transition from gliders to drones. Uh, the goal was clear. It says the enemy cannot be allowed to dominate the sky. There's an amazing quote from one of the senior players in this. He's it's a it's an interview, I guess, with this commander of the Air Force. Yeah, it was this, by the way, this is all in the Al Akbar uh, newspaper. So he, this this commander in the Hezbollah Air Force, he says, the Syrian experience where Hezbollah came to the aid of uh, Assad's government in Syria as they fought against Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the other U.S.-backed groups, takfiri groups is what, the, um, what Hezbollah calls them. He said... Um, Many times they were interested in knowing our tactics. Many times when we sent a recon squadron, the enemy would mobilize their intelligence forces to gather information about launch sites, location of the human crew, frequencies, and control tools. However, due to their arrogant nature, the enemy behaved as if they knew everything about us. In any case, time will show that what they knew was only what we allowed them to know. The Syrian experience represents a tremendous treasure for Hezbollah's Air Force. We learned in eight years what would have taken 16 years. And today, during Al-Aqsa flood, we are learning in nine months what would have previously taken over three years. So they got all of these flights in, right? Flight time, repetitions, sorties, reconnaissance operations, data analysis. They got the practice in the field, the invaluable practice during an actual war. And he said, although our fight was against the Takfiris, our eyes remained on Israel as the confrontation with them cannot be compared to any other battle. During the Syrian war, we had encounters with the enemy. We were just a step away from the Golan Heights. Many things happened. Um, the enemy assumed several times that it had downed our drones or taken control of them, but it was all part of a plan we had prepared to achieve certain goals. We were able to understand their detection capabilities and the functioning of their radar systems, as well as the ranges of their air defense weapons. So they're testing, they're probing, and all of this intelligence is going back to the Axis. Um, and they have... They have some, I don't, I wouldn't call it admiration, but they have some respect, some professional respect for the capabilities that the Israelis have in terms of intelligence gathering, radar coverage. Yeah, this, this commander says regarding radars and coverage areas, typically there are hundreds of kilometers between radars. In large countries, there are only 10 to 15 radars, but the enemy installs a radar every 30 kilometers along the border they distribute multiple layers of air defense far beyond what any other country does so israeli exceptionalism isn't just immunity to international law having right having right to rape rallies having right to starvation rallies destroying food aid or killing children in massive numbers israeli exceptionalism isn't just shooting off ammunition and mass quantities into into the air it is also exceptionalism in terms of the way they operate their radars they put their radars more densely and more air, there's more air defense than than anywhere and right now israel is protected with an air defense shield i'm sure um like nothing that's ever been assembled in human history and i think that's um Part of part of the delay that we're seeing is because of this. So 
there was okay what else can what else is there the most challenging scenario was operation al-aqsa flood um and this commander says if we were in a full-scale war without restrictions our operational capabilities would be vastly different because we we would also be launching thousands of rockets daily on its military and vital cent centers of various types and ranges. The enemy knows what is happening now as the Air Force is heavily constrained. So what prevents Hezbollah from targeting any strategic or sensitive objective? We are now in a crucial testing ground. At the beginning of the war, the success rate was low, but over time, Things reversed. After we became acquainted with our enemy, learned from the field, and introduced new tactics, the scales tipped, effectiveness increased, and the success rate improved. The enemy is also not complacent. They are working on things, but... Um, so there's this arms race uh, that's happening during the war usually it's a kind of a cold war situation and but now it's actually during the war and again that's what we can pretty confidently hypothesize is happening now is that the americans are trying to apply what they learned from the experience of april and whatever they've managed to learn over the past during alexa flood about what's likely to come at them and the access but powers are also trying to determine what they can do in the face of this missile shield that the Americans are putting in, in place. There's a special article just about shooting down that balloon drone, the Sky Do uh, operation. And there's an electric electronic warfare article where they talk about the radars, the jamming. There's a nice um, graphic of all the different Israeli radars. You want to see it? Why don't you take a look? So look at all of these different radars that they use. And these are specifically targeted. These are all targeted by... Uh, Hezbollah in their operations. Um, they also, so they are trying to target them, destroy them, and also overcome them. There's the cost of drones. So there's the economic element of the fact that the drones are cheaper than the systems that are used to jam them or stop them or shoot them down. And that's um, that's another major thing. There's there's a uh, the drone family. There's a there, you can look at you can look at a graph. They made a graphic of the Hezbollah drone family that are known: surveillance drones, offensive drones, T one and T two, diving distraction, and some unknown ones. And I'm sure there's always more surprises to come. The question is. How does this match up in the current war? And in the current in the current situation where now we've seen this, what the what I read in that seven part seven posts that I was reading to you uh, that I got on RNN about the axis of evil, Jordan, Cyprus, Saudi Arabia, the US, presumably France, Britain, and of course Israel, set it, getting all of these anti-missile systems and layered air defense into place. And then the Iranians revealing these new cruise missiles today and stating that they're not impressed by these systems that the Americans have put in place the Russians arriving and providing new equipment into the mix potentially, and also stating their support for Iran. And, you know, over in Ukraine, a, an offensive by Ukraine into Kursk 
which has also featured certain new capabilities in terms of drone warfare and drone swarms that the Ukrainians have done on the Russians, which pretty much means the Americans are testing out these, these capabilities. And so I think we'll see those transfer to the Israelis to, to work in the Israeli favor, Israelis favor is whatever Israel gets whatever Ukraine gets plus a lot more is generally how the question of American weapons and supplies and things has gone over the past couple of years. So here we are. Uh, everybody's preparing and the preparations are for a different kind of battle than we've seen there are major powers involved. There is, there are technologies that have not been seen together or deployed or contesting one another before. And uh, it just, I have, I have no idea how this is going to turn out. Meanwhile, the genocide continues. The Israelis continue to bomb tent massacres school massacres and it's actually become more intense over the past few days it's it's hard to imagine it becoming more intense but while they're debating on television the right to rape now and and having mass rallies over the right to rape they're also they're also um they're also doing these things um, they're also doing more intense, if that's even possible, bombings of civilians in Gaza and Kanyunis and in Nusayrat, all over, as well as ground operations where they're losing in Gaza City and Rafa, where they're having difficult incidents and difficult days, and their, their constant raids in the West Bank, including Tolkarim, as we speak. Um, killing prisoners, torturing them to death, all of that as well. Uh, I'm reading those reports, but I generally, I'm sure you're seeing those elsewhere. So I, I, I don't generally focus on them here. You can see more of that kind of thing on my Twitter feed. If that's, um, if you want to know that news as well, this, this channel and this, these sit reps, as you know, focus on the military uh, aspects of the situation. think I'll stop there. Um, this is going to go long and there's going to be some dramatic events fairly soon. So hang in there. Like and subscribe. Uh, I'll see you in the next.